If you have the word of God with you this morning, and I hope you do, uh, go ahead and open with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And this morning we are beginning a new series in the book of Hebrews called Hebrews, the Supremacy of the Son. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and we will read verses 1 and the first part of 2. And if you are willing, if you're able, if you would stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1. One. This is the word of God. Many times and many ways long ago, God spoke to our fathers in the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us in a son. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would come now in power by your spirit, and that you would raise the dead by your spirit, that you would pour out your spirit on those who need to repent and believe today. I pray, Lord, that you would pour out a spirit of comfort and encouragement upon those who are downcast and exhausted and just done with life today. Lord, I pray that your word would not go out in vain but that it would accomplish all that you have purposed for it to accomplish. And I pray, Lord, that you would do far more abundantly than we can think or imagine. And Lord, I pray most of all that Christ would be exalted and magnified and that we would walk away today seeing more of Christ and loving more of Christ and hungering and thirsting more after Christ, who is our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord and Savior the one who is reigning over us and interceding for us as we speak. For this all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning we begin a series in the book of Hebrews, which is really, according to Hebrews 13, 22, this book is really a brief word of exhortation. Meaning that according to the letter itself or the book itself, it is really most likely a sermon. A sermon which was preached maybe and copied down. And the reason that I've chosen the book of Hebrews or the exhortation found in Hebrews uh, is really threefold. First, it is the word of God which means that it is worthy of our time and worthy of our study and worthy of our meditation. And not only that, but it is the book in the New Testament, the book that shows us and teaches us time and time again that Christ himself is at the very center of the word of God. So it is, at the, it is the word of God and it shows us time and time again Christ as the centerpiece of the word of God. And that's the first reason we're studying Hebrews. The second one is because in my opinion, many Christians are completely and utterly ignorant when it comes to the Old Testament. When it comes to Genesis through Malachi, which is a huge problem. And Hebrews contains lots and lots of Old Testament quotations. And you know this if you've read through Hebrews, which means that as we are studying a new covenant or a New Testament book together, we will also grow in your knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament and what it really means or what it was pointing to. You will understand better the Old Covenant scriptures, Genesis through Malachi, as we study this New Covenant book together called Hebrews. And in doing this, I think we will learn how devastating it is to listen to guys like Andy Stanley who tell their churches to unhitch themselves from the Old Testament. And what we will actually see is that you cannot understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. And you cannot fully and properly understand the Old Testament without the New Testament, which means that we need to be entire Bible Christians. Genesis to Revelations. Revelations. <laughs> Revelation. <laughs> 
I was waiting for someone to correct me. Third, I've chosen Hebrews because a while back I did a series on covenant theology. I did a series on uh, the covenant family. And in these two series, what I did is I walked through the covenants in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We began in Genesis with the covenant that God makes with Adam, the covenant of works, and then the covenant of grace, which begins in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. We walked through the covenants that God made with Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. And then finally, we ended with the new or the eternal covenant, uh, which is inaugurated at Christ's incarnation. And so with all of that emphasis in our time together on covenant, the covenants of scripture and the covenant family and the way God deals with his covenant people, it seemed fitting to come to Hebrews because Hebrews is, as Gerhardus Voss has called it, the epistle of the diatheke, the epistle, the, the letter of the covenant. And so it seemed like a fitting place to come. And the reason that Hebrews is known as the, the epistle of the covenant is because the word for covenant occurs more times in this exhortation. That's 17 times. It occurs more times in this single exhortation than all the other new covenant books combined. 16 times. And so Hebrews focuses heavily on covenant and specifically the transition that happens from the old covenant administration of the covenant of grace to the new covenant administration of the covenant of grace. And if you don't know what any of that means, it's okay. That's why we're studying Hebrews. So if you don't know what that means, just relax. We're to say it another way. Hebrews focuses heavily on the transition from the old covenant on the way God was working the old covenant to the new covenant, which is inaugurated with the coming of Christ. The old covenant, which puts Christ forth in types and shadows and promises and prophecies and the transition from that into the new covenant where Christ, who is the substance and the reality, comes in the flesh. And so because of all of this, John Calvin has said this. He says, there is indeed no book in Holy Scripture which speaks so clearly of the priesthood of Christ, which so highly exalts the virtue and dignity of that only true sacrifice which he offered by his death which so abundantly deals with the use of the Old Testament ceremonies as well as their abrogation or their coming to an end, and in a word, so fully explains that Christ is the end of the law. And so because of this, and for these reasons, uh, we are going to begin our trek through the book of Hebrews this morning. And so as we look at verses 1 and 2a, I have three points I want us to consider. First, I want us to consider in general the God who speaks. The God who speaks. Second, I want us to consider the God who spoke long ago, focusing on verse 1. And then I want us to consider the God who has spoken in the last days, focusing in on 2a. So notice, as you're looking at your Bibles in these first two verses, that the author of Hebrews teaches us something incredibly important about God. And that is our God, the God of the Bible, he is the God who speaks. Now, why in the world is this so important? My guess is all of us already know that God has spoken. We know this. We have a book written by men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We know this. And while we might take it for granted, and we oftentimes do, the writer of Hebrews does not and in fact, that is the very way he begins. God has spoken. That's the way he begins his exhortation. God speaks. And in general, we know this to be true. In the beginning, God spoke. And what happened? Everything came to be. Right? That is the, 
That is the drive of Genesis chapter 1. There's a refrain that you see. God spoke and God said and it was thus. God said and it was so. And commenting on that, Psalm 33, 8 and 9 says this. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in all of him. Why? Why stand in all of this God? For he spoke. And it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. So God speaks. And when this God speaks, things come into being. Things happen. God speaking causes realities that did not exist to exist. Which means this. That God speaking carries infinite power and authority. So that things which were not in their being, in their existence, are. So it's not a light thing that God speaks. His speaking brings reality into existence. But more so, the writer of Hebrews is not referring to God speaking creation into existence. His general revelation, his creating of the creation. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to see that God has not just spoken in that way, but God has spoken to his people. And this is what we call special revelation. Special because it is directed especially at the people of God. Meaning that God did not just speak creation into existence in order that creation might proclaim his glory, which it does. But God speaks in a special and more specific way to his people. And now the question is, how? And the writer of Hebrews gives us two ways. But first, why does God speak to his people? Why is it necessary that God has spoken to us? Well, God is invisible. And he is incomprehensible. And he is eternal and infinite. Infinite. And therefore, what does that mean? It means that if God did not speak, if God did not reveal to us who he is, His covenant and his boundaries, his will, his demands, his expectations, his threats and his promises and his blessings and his and his curses. If he didn't speak, we might know his attributes and who he is as a spiritual and thus invisible being. We could not know him. You see why the writer of Hebrews begins with God speaking. Westminster Confession 7.1, my favorite paragraph in the entire confession, says this. The distance between God and the creature is so great, infinitely great, that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath pleased to express by way of covenant. Meaning that the infinite and incomprehensible God who spoke all things into existence with a word, he has infinitely condescended to us to speak That we might know the pathway into eternal life and fellowship with him in order that he might be our God and we his people. That is why God has spoken, not just generically bringing creation into existence, but he has spoken to us. A speaking that defines the terms of the covenant which is the pathway of life into fellowship, glorious fellowship, and everlasting life with the God who made us. And therefore, it should not surprise us that the epistle of the covenant, as Voss calls it, begins with God speaking. They come together 
The God who speaks is the God of the covenant, who speaks to his people, and he invites them, he invites us into everlasting life and glory with him through the covenant that he has established and then explained through speech. But how does he speak? How has God spoken to us? How has he given us the boundaries of the covenant, which is the very way of life with God now and forever? Well, Hebrews 1 makes it clear in verse 1 that this speaking did not begin with Christ coming in the flesh. That's not when God started speaking. That is not when salvation began. That is not when grace began. That's not when the covenant of grace began. No, instead, in verse 1, we learn this, that long ago, long ago, paleo, God spoke, and even more, in many ways and at many times. And to whom did this God speak? The fathers, the patriarchs. The fathers, and how did he speak to these fathers in the prophets? Meaning very clearly that God's speaking and God's covenant of grace with his people, it began long ago, well before Matthew chapter 1, well before Jesus was born of a virgin in Nazareth, well before his coming in the flesh. But now questions arise such as who are these fathers and who are these prophets and what does it mean by at many times and in many ways and what did he say? Well, the simple answer is everything that you see in the Old Covenant, everything that you see in Genesis through Malachi, which has been recorded for us. That's the simple answer. I think that's what the writer of Hebrews is referring to. The long ago at many times and in many ways is ultimately and in summary form all of God's dealings and speaking. His speaking with those in the old covenant as he spoke at various times and in various ways in his prophets. So if you want to know what God has said long ago, read your Old Testament from Genesis through Malachi. That's the simple answer. But as a way of illustration and more help, the fathers are those found specifically in the Old Testament scriptures who received a word from the Lord. And quite honestly, we can begin with Adam. Adam is the father of us all. And so therefore, he is the father of the recipients of this exhortation. And what did God say to Adam? Since we're talking about God speaking. Well, this is what he said. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Pre-redemptive special revelation. Meaning before the fall. This is what God says to Adam. Establishing the covenant of works. He says, Adam, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that's God speaking. And this is an example of God speaking long ago. So long ago that this is the first man that God made. And he's speaking to this man long ago. And he's establishing the covenant boundaries that Adam might know God. That he might enter into eternal life and fellowship with God through this established covenant which historically has been called a covenant of life or a covenant of works. Meaning, Adam, if you do not eat from this tree and if you obey me with perfect and exact obedience, you will eat from the tree of life and you will enter into eternal glory and fellowship with me, moving from your state of innocence into glory. That's the establishment. And that's God speaking. And when God speaks, he enters into covenant. You should begin to see that. But even after Adam and Eve sin, if you remember, God speaks again, right? Eve is deceived by the serpent. She eats. She gives some to Adam. And he eats. And then God comes. He comes in judgment. He comes in the wind of the day, the spirit of the day. And when he comes, he comes cursing the serpent. And he comes cursing the ground. 
subjecting it to futility, Romans 8. And this is what God says, speaking at another time to Adam and Eve and the serpent. Genesis 3, 15. God says, I, I will put enmity between you, Satan, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So these are examples of God speaking. But that is mainly God speaking at one time and in one way, verbally. <clears throat> we could also look at God speaking to Noah in Genesis 6 through 9, where we could see God speaking to Abraham in Genesis 12, another glorious promise. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But now watch. God is going to speak not verbally like he has been, but now in a vision. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So this is what the writer of Hebrews is wanting us to remember, church. This is just a small example of God speaking long ago at many times and in many ways. God, starting in Genesis, has began speaking. And he has began to slowly and progressively unfold his plan of redemption through covenants and through promises. And that is what the writer of Hebrews has in mind as he writes verse 1. God begins by speaking. And more importantly, he begins by speaking in Genesis 3.15, a promise, a promise about the offspring of Eve, the offspring of a woman who will come and crush this serpent and all of his activity and all that he has brought into being once and for all. What does this mean? It means that God did not just vomit all of his revelation out at one time and on one person at one place. What happens when that happens? Cults. That's typically what happens when God does that. But no, this is not the way the God of the Bible has established his revelation and his speaking. He has spoken long ago, many times, and in many ways. And we can consider God speaking as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. We can consider God speaking to Moses from the burning bush, commanding him to rescue Israel out of Egypt. We can consider God speaking to Moses at Mount Sinai, veiled in fire and smoke and thunder and lightning. Or we could consider God speaking in Moses, who is the, the, the prophet of God in the Old Testament. God speaking through him about the prophet who is to come, the prophet of all prophets. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. It says, the Lord your God, this is Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, my God, or see the great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command." And as the people of Israel wait for this prophet, who is the prophet, God continues speaking to them in Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micaiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, and on. 
And all this time, God is speaking at many times and in many ways, in visions and in dreams and audibly in and through his prophets. And what is the point? The point is that slowly and progressively through the prophets to the fathers, in many ways and at many times, the Lord is making clear the redemptive plan that he has established before the foundations of the world. He is making clear in history, in time and space, through many people at many times and in many ways, his way of salvation, his promise to restore all things, and his promise ultimately to raise the dead, which means this. As you are reading your Bible from Genesis and onward, it is going somewhere. It is moving somewhere. It is aiming toward a certain climax and consummation. Every word and every generation and every different way that God has spoken long ago, it is heading toward not just a certain time in history, it is heading toward a certain person in history. And because of this, F.F. F. Bruce says this, The story of divine revelation is a story of progression up to Christ. And there is no progression beyond him. And that's exactly what verse 2a says. The special revelation of long ago, beginning in Genesis, which occurred many times and in many ways all throughout your Old Testament scriptures, it was not random, but it was going somewhere. And even though it was not random and it was God speaking infallibly, it was not yet complete. It was a slow, methodical, progressive climb toward the person and work of Christ who would appear in the last days as promised by and hoped for by the prophets. So we move to verse 2. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers in the prophets. What does this mean? It means that God was in them. The Holy Spirit did not just show up in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit was in these prophets, and he was speaking regarding his covenant and his salvation and the restoration of all things. But in these last days, the writer of Hebrews tells us, God has spoken not just in a prophet, but in a son. And the point here, which I want us to see this morning, is that the Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, son of Abraham, Jesus, son of David, and the Virgin Mary, Jesus, the promised offspring of Eve, he is the climax of God's speaking. That's the point. When you see Christ in the scriptures in Matthew through Revelation, Do you understand that when Jesus comes in the flesh into the world, it is God speaking? That's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand. He is the climax or the consummation or the mountaintop of God's special revelation to his people. And why is this? Because Jesus is the greatest and fullest revelation of who God is, Not because he is speaking words which God has given him to speak, which he does, but because he is God. He is the God man. Two natures in one person in the hypostatic union, which means he is two persons, not intermingled, not partly God and partly man, not 50 50. Not 66, 34. He is 100% God and 100% man. And if you can't figure that out, join the club. This is why he is the climax of God speaking. Because he is not just a man coming with the words of God. But he is God incarnate. He is God himself. He is the climax of God's preaching and speaking because he is the speech of God. He is the speech of God manifest, fleshly. And because he comes as God incarnate, uttering the words of God. 
And because all of this is true, he is called in Scripture, the Word. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verses 14, 17, and 18. And the Word became flesh, this eternal God, who is God and was with God, He became flesh and dwelt, or tabernacled literally, tabernacled among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Therefore, the Son is the eternal word or logos, the eternal consciousness. He is the eternal word of God, eternally existent with the Father. He has never had a beginning, and he will never have an ending. But this Son of God, who is eternal and of the same substance and equal in power and glory to the Father. He takes on human flesh and he comes into the world as the speech of God. The speech of God in human flesh. And he comes living among men as the visible word, as the visible message. And therefore, the the point the writer of Hebrews wants us to glean is that in the incarnation of Christ, in his life and in his suffering and in his death on the cross and in his burial and in his resurrection from the grave and in his ascension to the right hand of the Father, God is speaking. And what is he saying? Well, that's why we're going to spend the next five years in Hebrews. <laughs> you see the point. Jesus' resurrection is not just an event. It is God proclaiming something. His death on the cross is not just an event, but the word in the flesh is proclaiming, not with his lips only, but in his life, the word of God. Every action of Christ and every word of Christ and every moment in Christ's life is God speaking. His actions are proclaiming as much as his mouth. And this is the way Jesus understood his ministry. Meaning that God is not just, he is not just revealing himself in and through prophets. Not anymore, but he has climactically revealed his plan, his way of salvation, the way of the covenant, in the coming of Christ himself, in the flesh, and Jesus wants his disciples and all of us to see this very fact. And so he says things like this, John 14, 9 and 10. He says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Now listen to this. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. In other words, to hear me is to hear the Father, and to see me is to see the Father. And that has never been said or seen before. Therefore, in this way, Christ is the prophet of all prophets, the prophet par excellence, the prophet of God who not only speaks the word of God in his ministry, but the prophet of God who is the word of God in the flesh, fully and climactically revealing the word of his father to us in his person and in his work in real time and in real history. This is what Genesis is leading to. This is what the promise in Genesis 3 is aiming at. This climactic moment in which Christ himself enters into the world in the flesh 
preaching in his life and in his words. And when he comes, the writer of Hebrews says, it is the inauguration of the last days. The last days are the end of the ages, a Pauline phrase. They are inaugurated when God's final climactic word is spoken in his son. In and through a son who is Christ. And with the end of the ages. And these last days comes many great changes. Many great changes regarding the tabernacle and the priesthood, and the sacrificial system, the way of atonement, the day of uh, atonement, worship. Because the last days have been inaugurated in the coming of Christ in the flesh, there are some great changes that must happen. And that is what we see in the book of Hebrews. Christ brings these changes. He brings the last days. He inaugurates the end. And so in the book of Hebrews, what we see is God speaking with an exclamation point in his son. Bringing all things to an end and to a change. Although we aren't there yet. Hebrews is about the supremacy of the son. In and over all things. Over and above all the prophets who came before, all the high priests who came before, and all the kings who came before. And why? Because he is not just a prophet who speaks the words of God, but he is the word of God. He is not just a priest or a high priest who offers earthly offerings of blood every day or once a year in the Holy of Holies. But he is the high priest who offers himself once for all. To bring all of that to an end. All for the forgiveness of sins. And he is the king who is raised and ascended in immortal and incorruptible flesh. Reigning and ruling and interceding over us and on behalf of us in the highest heavens. Until he returns to bring this world to its knees. This is what Hebrews is about. It's about the glory of the Son. And all of the changes that come to be now that we are transitioning from the old covenant and all that God had said and done in that old covenant and the new covenant, which is inaugurated in Christ. So as we close, I want us to consider two great applications and then we'll be done. First, I want us to understand, and I hope you're seeing this, that if you understand what I've said this morning, it should revolutionize your Bible reading. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when you read your Bible now, especially Genesis through Malachi, you should be reading it in this way. You should be reading it and understanding it and thinking about it in this way, meaning you should be reading Genesis as a book that is ultimately bringing us and leading us to Christ who comes inaugurated in the last days. When you read Leviticus that everyone's always whining about and complaining about, you should read it like this. Seriously, how do you read it like this and find it boring? You find it boring because you don't understand. You think about all the bloodshed in Leviticus. It's worse than a butcher shop. And what is that preaching? It's preaching the blood of Christ. When you read Leviticus with this paradigm and with this framework in mind, and you see the ascension offerings, and you begin to see Christ, you won't want to put it down. If you begin to read your Bible this way, seeing Christ in every chapter, in every book of the Bible, bringing us ultimately to his incarnation and the climax and the exclamation point of God speaking in him, you will actually for the first time understand the Old Testament. And in fact, it is Christ speaking in the Old Testament about his sufferings, which are to be. Did you know that? When the prophets speak, Christ is speaking. 
Here's what I mean. First Peter 1, 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them. Did you catch that? Inquiring, they're trying to figure out. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent, subsequent glories. I wish that was a Greek word. I would have got it. It's been fine. <laughs> English is my worst language. If you understand this, you will devour your Bible in a new way. You will begin to see Christ in Genesis 3. Christ in Genesis 4. Christ in Genesis 5. You will see how all of Scripture is leading us ultimately to Christ. Meaning that Genesis to Revelation is all about Christ. Not just Matthew through Revelation. And here's the second application. Whether it is the old covenant scriptures, long ago, many times, and in many ways, or the new covenant scriptures, it is one God speaking at both times. It is the one God who spoke long ago, and it is the one God who has spoken in these last days. And here's why this matters, church. If God curses and judges those in the Old Testament who rejected the incomplete word that came through prophets, his infallible word. How much worse will the judgment be for those who have rejected his son, who is the apex and climax of his speech? How much hotter the fiery flames of hell for those who not only reject the words of God spoken infallibly through Isaiah, but those who reject the word of God, which was manifested in the flesh of Jesus Christ. With the escalation of God speaking and climaxing in the sun comes an escalation of judgment. We'll see that later in Hebrews as well. What does this mean? This means that you should repent quickly. You should repent today and cast yourselves upon this Christ, upon this Messiah, upon this word of God who comes into the world living and dying for sinners. The one who has been raised in glory to never die again, ascending into the highest heavens where he has promised to bring us that we might be with him. But here's the flip side, more encouraging. I don't want to end there. That would not be good preaching. Here's the flip side. If God blessed those who heeded the words of Moses, and if God gave the children of Israel the promised land because they heeded the words of Moses and they followed him through the wilderness trusting in God as he spoke through Moses, how much more will he bless those who heed the words of his son. Amen. Amen. How much more assuredly will he pour out salvation and eternal life on those who hear the word of Christ and believe. And so do not reject the word, any of it. Do not reject the old covenant word. Do not reject the new covenant word. Do not reject the son, but instead see him as the centerpiece and the consummation of all of God's speaking and realize, as Paul has said, that in him, in this Christ, who has come in the flesh, all the promises of God find their yes. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you have spoken because we know that if you did not speak to us, we could not truly know you. We could not enjoy you. We could not have eternal life and fellowship with you. We couldn't know our sins. We wouldn't even know what to repent of. We wouldn't know what is wrong with us, but you have been so kind, Lord, in speaking 
and showing us your glory and all of your attributes and showing us our sin and our unworthiness, showing us that we are children of wrath before your grace raises us up from the dead. And you have showed us your grace and your love and your compassion in Christ who is crucified for us. Now, Lord, I pray that every heart would be drawn to you, that every person in this room would repent and trust in you, Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. We might know you and be with you forever in this age and the one to come. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.